uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Kim Porter. Um, I'm the executive director of Be A Part of the Conversation. I think I know a lot of the people on this call. Um, this is our second in a series of online programs taking place every Tuesday night at this time at 7 p.m. Um, we're looking forward to getting back into the rooms with people uh, in person, but for now, this is what we are working with and it's working so far so good. Last week, we had a very nice program. You can see the video for that. Um, on our YouTube page, which will be sent, a link will be sent to you um, tomorrow as a follow up to this event. Tonight we have Mike Blanche with us. Uh, he's going to discuss transitioning technology to be healthy. Um, and I know that Mike is busier than ever these days. So I really want to sincerely thank him for his time and for stepping up and helping us to launch this series of programs in such a beautiful way. Uh, as an attendee, you are in viewing mode only so that you're not visible on this webinar, nor can we hear you at this time. Um, you do have the option to type a question, which will be addressed. I'm gonna actually take you through a little example of how that works. Um, and also wanna introduce you to Tessa Ricci. She's our communications director. Say hi, Tessa. Hi, everybody, I'm Tessa. Okay, we're so happy that Tessa's with us. Um, she will be helping me to keep track of your questions. Uh, she'll not, she and I'll be checking all through the program. Um, we have uh, right now, I think we have 13 people, 13 people. So it shouldn't be too hard to manage that, I don't think. Um, we're recording this webinar, but your questions will not be visible in the recording. The link to the recording will be available tomorrow on our website. Um, and uh, or, and on YouTube on our YouTube page, uh, so you'll be getting an email tomorrow with a link to a survey as well, um, so that you can tell us if this was helpful to you, what you might like to hear in the future, and so on. So let me just quickly I'm going to share my screen and take you through this. So basically, this is what most of your screens would look like, um, whether you're on a cell phone or a laptop or a tablet or some other device. Um, so basically, if you would like to um, ask a question, you can click on your Q&A button and ask a question there. And that's what Tessa and I'll be keeping an eye on. You also, oh, this is what will show up when you ask that question. So you can ask it there. You can also choose to click that little button that's what it looks like before you click it. You can click that button and send it anonymously. Um, and then you can either get an answer this way or we'll queue it up and have Mike answer you directly. Um, you also have the option to chat and that would be chatting probably with Tessa and myself. Um, and you can type that in right there and we'll get back to you. You can also uh, raise your hand. If you raise your hand, we will give you the option of um, joining us so that you can then you'll we'll make you like a panelist and you won't actually be a panelist but you can then have the option to unmute yourself or even to um, start videotaping or running your video so that people can actually see and hear your questions so you have that option otherwise you could do those other kind of formats um, oh and i wanted to ask you to not um, bother with these other buttons down here they're not necessary and also just want to mention what we have coming up uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we're still putting this together, but we're going to have a panel of some parents. Uh, we're going to talk about boundaries. Boundaries are very challenging for those of us parents who have a son or daughter, either in active addiction, in early recovery, even in long-term recovery. Um, what do our boundaries look like these days? You know, when we might have someone under our roof that we wouldn't normally, um, based on a lot of different uh, kinds of scenarios. So we'll be going through that and talking about how we can take care of ourselves during this challenging time. Um, we also have a follow-up to last week's program where you can visit um, conversation.zone slash pathways and you'll see the video of the presenters that we had. Mike was on that panel as well last week um, and so forth. And we have the Staying Connected page. So all of that is on our follow-up page. Here's all about tonight. Um, but it's all conversation.zone slash online. So all of that is available to you there. So I'm gonna stop. Kim, I didn't see that. The, the follow-up page, could you go back? Because it didn't, it just showed that one oh, uh, sure. screen. So 
for people to see it, I thought that would be really cool for, for you to see like the wet. So it just showed that. So this is what uh, didn't come through on my, so that's it. Thank you. Oh, okay, sure. Yep, this is, this is where you can find everything that has happened, is happening. Here's tonight's program. Um, there's Mike. Hi, Mike. Um, and here's what's coming up next week. And here's the, the, the follow-up program from last week. We're going to be adding more dates and topics here. We have a, we actually have a lot already planned out. So um, I'll be loading those in the next day or two so that you'll see all about that. Okay. That's great. It just didn't come through. It just kind of locked on that screen. So I want people to see it. So thanks. Got it. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Mike. Oh, I think you're muted somehow, Mike. Um, oh, there you go. So I, I was even going to answer the first question. What's the best way it, is just tell folks to, to get on the email list from Kim and, and be part of the conversation. And, and uh, that's the best way to kind of get invited or you can pass along the link and, and it's really easy to kind of, kind of get on. Yep. Uh, so first I want to thank Kim and Tessa for being a part of this tonight. And, and again, be a part of the conversation, which has been a great part of, uh, of how I see things and, and um, how I view treatment in the last, uh, so I've been providing drug and alcohol treatment for, for 25 years. I've worked at all levels of drug and alcohol treatment. And uh, the past 10 or 15 years have gotten more into prevention uh, because I see prevention as, as, a, as a real kind of need for treatment as a huge vital part of treatment. And in this age, I think it's more and more important uh, to kind of add a vehicle uh, through this digital age to kind of help families see that, you know, conversations can happen even at this time, even in this vital time to, to strengthen the community. The, the meetings um, may not happen in person, but we need to continue to bridge the way, any which way we can to kind of get uh, connected and, and stay connected. And, and that's the best way through mental health, through substance abuse and recovery. So thank you, Kim. Thank you, Tessa, for the process. So uh, when it comes to tonight, um, I was looking at um, just starting off with uh, some slides about, you know, my presentation and, and again, kind of add some basics to an old topic that I've done for a lot of years. And you can see that I've kind of updated some slides already. Uh, but it, this is an old slide of media, media messaging and youth. And tonight, uh, transitioning this time away from that old kind of view of how we looked at Facebook, you know, and this is the old drug of choice when it comes to kids and how they were addicted to this. But this is now a resource and we got to change the scope of how we look at this uh, so we don't act like a fuddy-duddyism. I don't know if you're familiar with this term, but uh, the clinical term fuddy-duddyism means that basically uh, you don't want to talk down to your kids. You don't want to talk down to your, your peers and, and saying that, you know, this, this uh, rock and roll music is going to make you do drugs, Mike, and, or this technology, this is really going to be the end of us. And clearly it's not. Clearly it's a way for us to connect if we're able to shape it if we're able to really see it uh, for what it is. Uh, there's been so much shift in the last couple of months. There's been so much happening um, in our world uh, since January um, that we really have to kind of move and adapt and specifically with technology, uh, how we can utilize it and use it and define it as opposed to letting, up, letting it define us. Uh, so I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Uh, and so to give you an idea of the shift and the scope, you know, this is the same image. I love this image. It's, it's the same shot in 2005 of the announcement of a Pope in Italy. And then 2017, the same angle, the same uh, time. You could even see on the one corner here, there's a flip phone in 2005. I don't know if you guys or ladies remember a flip phone. Uh, but now 2013 seems like eons ago, but a relatively short period of time, you know, our world has shifted now today, this is last week, this is how the United Kingdom is running their government through Zoom, you know, and this is how we're brought to terms with how we have to live in a world where we have to utilize this. And this is this week's staff meeting at Ethos, uh, our treatment center, my treatment center. And this is how we communicate almost daily now um, and, uh, and how we have communication constantly um, through different Zoom products or Google Meet or whatever. Uh, therefore, we have to embrace this piece. So the shift in the last couple of weeks of, of how COVID-19 has really affected us and, and what has happened in our world is a pretty big deal. So um, was there any questions right off the bat that were, were uh, important for me to kind of touch on or anything that I can follow up on later? Everything I can follow up on later? Okay. Um, and so I wanted to start by putting things into context a little bit and just take a moment and, and say, again, for the people that are on this call, 
Uh, my heart goes out to all the families that are, that are kind of feeling isolated or disconnected during this time. But again, utilizing technology in a way that's helpful and healthy to get connected and stay connected in an appropriate way is really important. But we've been, uh, as a society and as individuals, uh, in a major loss process, uh, an ambiguous loss of being able to connect. Uh, and that's one of my first kind of contextual pieces in the last couple of months, last couple of weeks. Uh, and we're still going to feel that loss and not just losing people, losing individuals, but losing certain ways that we would connect. If it's the kid at Starbucks that I would see every morning, I'm sponsored by Starbucks. And, and I would go in every day and I would see the same kid and, and I would have a 30 second conversation. And that meant something to, to me or the, from that to the, the interactions after a meeting or before a meeting or in a hallway uh, of, of walking through and talking through with somebody. And that extra kind of 30 second conversation goes a long way. You know, we're losing a lot of those nonverbal communications that are subtle, uh, that are important for us to, to really uh, honor that we have to look out for. And, and the other two big things that we're up against, uh, I know um, a lot of us are losing uh, a sense, or, or I'm sorry, experiencing a sense of anxiety, uh, where we have a lot of what's called anticipatory anxiety. We have a lot of numbers a lot of ideas about what could happen in the future, what's going to happen in the future, and I don't know about you, uh, but we're inundated so often, and we've been kind of trained now for like years uh, because of this thing uh, brought to you by um, this thing called a cell phone, and this notification of like instantly, we have a notification of uh, when this or that's popping up. So we have this constant noise and this constant flow of information that we're not ability to digest, and I'm, I'm begging people every day of the week. I'm, I'm a therapist and, and I'm, I'm seeing clients every day and I'm begging clients to, to look at this time and to really not, not shut down from technology or shut off from, from the news, but to pick your battles about when and how you, you kind of let the faucet of news in uh, because it can be overwhelming. You could be drowning from it. Um, but the other, the other big thing uh, that people are up against is feeling stuck. Uh, so a lot of times people feel stuck um, and that happens a lot where uh, when they feel stuck in their uh, process of being stuck in their home or stuck in their life or stuck literally just sitting on the bench, uh, they feel powerless. And that powerlessness feeling is, is very traumatic for some and also could be very challenging for some. So in the midst of this, um, my buddy and I came up with this term. Uh, that we're up against uh, something else called the Corona clock. And what I say to people is what time a day does this kind of hit you guys? And, and, and everybody kind of has that thought or that time during the day that it, it all kind of hits you. Uh, and again, technology could be an asset or technology could be a part of the liability. And that's what I'm challenging people to assess uh, when it comes to one of the first things is news. Uh, we've been up against this sensationalized news of so much information that we're led to read the next blip and the next sound bite uh, to get pulled in to watch the next news bite. But the truth is we gotta take a moment, we gotta take pause and really decide when and how we're gonna kind of listen to it to really be uh, resonating with it as opposed to sometimes we get subjected to and subjected to it. We're almost in a concussion effect of how much st stuff kind of comes on us all the time. Uh, so the term I, I came up with and my buddy really came up with is the Corona clock. Like when does this kind of hit you during the day? And, and uh, for my wife and I, the first week, we would wake up at four o'clock in the morning and, and uh, start talking at 4 a.m. and just talk through and be like, what do you think is going to happen? How's this going to work out? And now week two, week three into this, we're saying, okay, you know, we're able to sleep through the night and periodically we'll check in during the day through it. And, and again, it's important to talk through in person or over the phone with anybody. Uh, that that kind of gets hit with that. Uh, so again, I caution people: how often are you checking the news right away as a family and as individuals? So, since this past January, though, the rapid increase of internet usage has gone up dramatically. WhatsApp, uh, you guys know that that app that a lot of times is a global app has gone up five times in regular use. The spike of use of traffic, internet traffic, has gone up seventy percent. And I don't know about you, but about my bandwidth at home. Is paper thin now. I have so many devices anyway, and I'm working from home. I'm doing these live teeth. So it's not just um, the bandwidth at home, but it's a bandwidth in ourselves. Like how much can we take on? Uh, and that's an important thing to note as well. And so when it comes to this spike uh, and this transition, you know, I want you guys to think about the con context of this. Like how long did it take 
radio to get to 50 million users 38 years? How long did it take television to get to 50 million viewers 13 years? How long did it take the internet? It took four years. Social media sites only 16 months. And now it's over 2.4 billion people involved in, in, in a thing called Facebook. And telehealth uh, in March 2020, uh, the Zoom went up 25% in one week, uh, Zoom usage. That may not sound like a lot, but you know, when it comes to telehealth, I met with the state of Pennsylvania. We, our, our programs are licensed by uh, beat up your drug and alcohol providers. In, in, in uh, uh, February, uh, it was not on their books to, to license or even begin to talk about telehealth. They, didn't, they had no plan in 2020, but by the end of that first week in March, I'll tell you, they, they started sending memos and we started having meetings and all of our sites are licensed now, telehealth and all the insurance companies are recognizing telehealth and, it, and it's incredible the, the surge, the rapid ability to kind of turn around and be available of service uh, for a lot of programs has been amazing as well as the rate of abilities to shift for folks in recovery and, and the amount of meetings online, the amount of rapid availability we talked about last week, which I was, I was so blown away by how many people have been able to adapt and, and shift uh, and have uh, numerous, numerous meetings online for recovery, for 12 step, for families. Uh, and, and Kim and your programming has been an amazing resource to have for families to hear about. So some of the other statistics a lot of families like to know is like, 87% of the U.S. population is on the internet, probably a lot more now, probably closer to 100%. 100% uh, was this one report that said about all about 100% of 18 to 35 year olds report online, online connection. Facebook is still uh, the leading research, uh, the leading, I'm sorry, the leading um, social platform, uh, 2.4 billion active users. And again, uh, this was at the end of last year. I think there's a lot more going on right now. Same thing with Instagram is about 1 billion. Again, that was Q4 of uh, 2019. Um, and th these are all again at the end of 2019, 330 million active users of Twitter. Uh, again, that's a low number compared to all those other ones and 660 on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is a viable resource. So, so again, the numbers wise, the percentage of folks that are activating and utilizing, it's not just kids. Again, like families and people uh, are really, involved with this thing and again it's really important to think about so so why why do i want to talk about it now what is it about now today march uh or i'm sorry april 7th uh 2020 why today uh do i really want to talk about it uh when it comes to to technology and and, and how we really have to be mindful and respectful of this thing called technology and, and the next slide i wanted to pause because it's really important to me uh, when it, when i look at technology and i view it uh, these are some really important things to think about when you're approaching a kid, when you're approaching yourself, uh, when you're approaching your family of how you talk about technology. It's not an all or nothing today. It's not about technology is the enemy or technology is the best or technology is the worst. It's really looking at these next couple things um, as important things. And, and the first uh, dissonant idea, the dissonant tech time, um, I want to get across is uh, one second. I'm sorry. I just want to get this up. Dissonant tech time. This first thing is mindless scrolling. How many of you can can raise your hand and say that you know you've you've found yourself on on you name it Facebook, Instagram, whatever, or news, and just kind of mindlessly not thinking about it. The next thing you know, you're you're on it for 20 minutes and you're not even paying attention to what you're scrolling through. So mindless scrolling is one thing that sets up a dissonant meaning a distraction, a disconnect, and not really being mindful of what's, what you're kind of ingesting. It's kind of like um, mindless eating. You know, if you think about the person that starts grazing, the next thing you know, they start binge eating, they have no idea where it started. Uh, mindless watching of anything or, or, or any one thing as well, like uh, watching Netflix and all of a sudden you, you go to the next. Uh, I don't know if you know, like YouTube videos, for instance. YouTube spends a lot of money and a lot of research on algorithm and algorithms that want you to keep watching. So you're gonna watch a video and at the end of a YouTube video, they're gonna say, if you like this, play this next. Again, that is research that wants you to like that, that if you like this, then you like that. And it, and it kind of floats you in a direction without your awareness. Then the next thing you know, you're mindlessly going off on a corner that you may not want to. Um, the next one I'm really, uh, really, you've heard me already talk about, 
is watching too much no, uh, news. And I was, I was a, and I, this is my projection, this is my ownership. Early on the stages of this, even even until recently this week, the numbers are going to be really difficult to watch, and 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 it's something that everybody's prepared for. We're in the middle of this baseball game, and I think we're in the fourth or fifth inning of this. We got a long way to go. So looking at every strike or every out or every pitch, it's it's really hard to kind of take in and really feel. Uh, so it's really important to pick your battles about when you watch your news. I want people to think about the time of day when I would get my dad the newspaper and I would get it and I'll bring it to him and he would watch the new, he, he, I'm sorry, he would read the newspaper one point during the day. And then my folks would, would um, watch news at the end of the day and the nightly news. And that's it. You know, there was a day where that was enough news. We didn't need to constantly berate ourselves with information from hour to hour. And, and, and again, that's, that's my own kind of takeaway from these last two weeks for myself and my family. Um, the other piece is that some people get obsessed and certain people with anxiety that already have a, have a setup for it, get kind of preoccupied with one corner of the world or one aspect of this whole thing or focused on, um, I don't know if you saw this recently, the whole masks thing. Do you know how many places you can buy masks today? Or I don't know about you guys, but on my Instagram feed will show you, uh, where to buy masks and, and the latest place to, to buy it. And it's like, people get so fixated on one piece of this whole puzzle and again, we got to take mindfulness and not get too obsessed about this one kernel, which is important, but it, it leads us down a track. Um, and this next thing is, is not taking uh, breaks from screen time. And I'll tell you, as a clinician, I went from sitting across from people all day long. I went from the energy of running groups and seeing people. And you get a feel of like being able to sit across from people all day long. And, and I went from that to... Now, uh, when I'm in a, in a session, it's virtual. I'm staring at a screen. I'm staring at screens. And my first couple days of it, I walked in to see my wife. And I'm like, I got these headaches. And, and my eyes are dehydrated. And my sister, actually, the nurse came in and, and, and on a phone call. Didn't come in uh, reality-wise, but came in virtually and said, you know, uh, everybody's complaining that, that when you're staring at a screen, your eyes get dehydrated. When you're and, and I went from not looking at a screen all day long to looking at a screen all day long and the light's coming at me. And the next thing you know, I'm getting dehydrated. I'm getting a headache. I'm, I'm, you can hear it on my voice. I've been talking all day. This is my last uh, event of the day. So I get dehydrated and that runs me down and my energy levels. And uh, we do daily supervision in our practice and our, in our settings of our, our, our centers. And uh, we do weekly bigger groups uh, of supervision and all of our therapists are doing a great job. And I, and I love all of our therapists, they're amazing. Uh, but one of the big complaints is it's a real energy drainer as a therapist to stare at a screen and really it's a, it's so we got to take care of ourselves as society, as people, as families, because staring at a screen as adults is one thing as a kid too. It really does. They don't capture how much energy it can really deplete them uh, when they're, when they're not being mindful. So again, it's, it's really important to look at how much screen time um, and, and then you ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how much people know this, but, your eyes, if you're staring at one kind of set screen, uh, you'll see me, I'm looking at two different screens right now. And it's so important because when I'm looking at two different screens, it's actually making my eyes work uh, and, and actually focus and defocus. And even that helps my eyes to feel less uh, strained. Uh, so by looking at two different levels or two different strands, so sometimes uh, what I do to break up my day, I'll be in session, I'll use my laptop for some, I'll use my iPad for others, I'll lift up. And I'll, I'll sit up, and I'll, I'm at a standing desk, and sometimes I'll sit down. And so that really helps to kind of break up the monotony of how I'm viewing and how I'm interacting with this very kind of flat kind of piece of plastic called a laptop or iPad. So I got to uh, beg people to think about how they're interacting with the screen and taking screen time. And I'll, I'll talk about that in solutions in a little bit. Um, and lastly, the, the, the last kind of note on this thing, uh, uh, why this is such a concern right now um, is that it's it, it's sometimes for some people the only way to connect you know and so trying to find other ways to connect uh, beyond just the screen beyond just social media beyond and that could be connection uh, in other ways uh, to people and I'll explain that later on but if people feel dependent upon this technology dependent upon their Wi-Fi link uh, it, it really kind of sets people up to feel too vulnerable. Uh, and I'll explain that later on as well. So, um, 
any questions that I should know about or should I just kind of keep going? Is everybody cool if I just keep going? Yeah, that's fine, Mike. Nothing's come up yet. You're good. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm not, and then I don't know how to forward my screen. Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is that up? Uh, you're not sharing right now. Gotcha. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, there it is. Got it. And I'm in. Beautiful. Okay. Um, these ones are classic things that I'm going to leave up and I'm going to leave as a part of the sign that uh, slides that are helpful for, for folks that work with adolescents. It's good to know these are nationally surveyed things about kids and, and their teen time and their screen time. And, uh, and again, in this contextual time right now, I don't want families to worry about this specific number and get focused in on a number. This was regarding kids that feel disjointed, disconnected, and are spending way too much time or are more at risk uh, for suicidality if their, their only relationships came from just this format and that's the only way they felt connected. Um, and then the emotional challenges with teachers, uh, and the amount of uh, times that we've done this presentation in schools, the amount of feedback that I've gotten from schools, uh, from fifth grade centers, sixth grade centers, uh, that are experiencing uh, the impact of, of mobile devices in their classroom setting uh, is massive. So again, it's going younger and younger and younger. So um, the sleep is an issue still to this day. Um, depression and, and uh, how uh, this is this last statistic around 89% of parents blame themselves uh, for their, their child's phone use, especially during this time. There's so many parents that are taking on too much responsibility. The fact is we all as a society, as a family, have to just get through this time period. So if there's only one sentence you hear from me tonight, I, I need families to be easy on yourselves through this time, uh, that we have to get through this collectively and, and maybe loosen our kind of ways of balance and loosening our ways, I'm sorry, of, of constriction of, of kind of uh, screen time. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, these are, again, classic kind of slides that I talk about why technology could be uh, challenging clearly the misinformation highway if uh, if kids or, or adults are looking at um, uh, wrong information or they're not looking up up, up to date information there's modal influences going on their dissemination without kind of filters or there's a there's a lot of issues that, that pop up classically as well as contextually in this time but this last one goes to that loss of nonverbal cues that loss of communication and that's where i recommend uh, FaceTime as much as possible, um, sending videos as much as possible. It's my nephew's birthday today and I sent him a video. Um, and, and as opposed, to, I couldn't get on a call with him, but as opposed to just uh, sending him a text, I wanted him to, to know that I cared and I'm going to reach out to him after this call. But the point is, is that idea of like being able to see somebody, hear somebody, hear somebody's tone, at least we can capture some of that through these uh, Zoom meetings. And you can capture some of that in, in some, because there's a big difference between, hey, how are you doing? I'm really worried about you. Uh, and, and hearing the tone of somebody's voice or seeing somebody's eyes and, and, and seeing that concern to, hey, what are you doing? I'm really worried about you. And that tone of like uh, either uh, shame or that tone of, of questioning and not, not, not trusting. Um, and so uh, it's interesting, like, I actually um, also have been doing a lot of family meetings and family sessions in the home setting where I actually set up Zoom meetings where uh, as opposed to, uh, if you can imagine like Johnny and his parents sitting awkwardly on top of each other staring at a little screen, I have them all go in their own rooms and all go their own devices and so they can actually look at each other uh, to have communication so that they can see each other and, and the dad said to his son today like, hey listen, I, I'm seeing you're shutting down. And he's like, yeah, I'm just tired of being on this call. I'm tired of staying at the, and, and so they were able to process that by looking at each other as opposed to elbow to elbow staring at their own screen. So again, shifting the conversation into utilizing screen time of being able to actually see somebody. They were in their own home. They, were, they, were, they could have been sitting across from each other, but for me to perform therapy with them as a family, I needed them to see each other to really capture those subtleties, those, those nuances. Because this, this study has been done a couple of ways uh, some say 87%, some say 90% of communication is nonverbal. 
and again, that's the tonality. That's the, and, and again, that's where I don't want to rely on text. And I don't want people to rely on text. So again, our world is inundated with all these different forms of technology and it's up to us to how we digest them and how we as a family kind of construct them and how we kind of manage all this system coming at us because it could be too much. And, and, and again, if your family dinner table looks like this, this this week, I don't want you to beat yourself up. If it looks like this every day for the next two months, that's gonna be an issue or the next two or three weeks every day. But I don't want it to look like this all the time. I don't want your modern family to look like this all the time. The truth is you will get distracted. The, the reality is things will pop up. Uh, work still needs to happen for some working from home. Um, but it's important to find technology free time because ultimately parents who are thousand school teachers, kids watch what you do. Uh, so you don't want your kids modeling behavior. You don't want your kids looking up to you and just seeing this uh, because what, what technology and what the real concern is around uh, technology, if they're only just texting or if they're only sending messages, is it's fragmented uh, language leads to fragmented relationships and it leads to lack of healthy supports and lack of social supports. And it could, could get to a place where losing modeling behavior and that's kind of like this this next kind of slide of, of importance to, to think about in that does that make sense um so this is where i get into the idea that it's this is more about video games and, and also instagram and, and social media with kids um if you ever want to listen to a video game live and, and hear how the kids talk to each other there's a lot of foul, foul language bullying language uh with social media uh, it's really important to think about with body image and, and how uh, there's apps that'll make your face look better and everything else. And, and so that's a significant concern. Um, the term that we're up against is the sexualization of our youth and how many kids get exposed to pornography. Uh, and again, like so many parents look out for the laptops, but they forget about the small screen uh, and the exposure to that and, and, and the gaming, the violence there. So it, it really, um, is a is a significant concern the, the the amount of exposure going on right now um but it's really important to think about so let me pause because i want to bounce through a couple of things um there are specific things around uh, body image issues which i can bounce back to if you want uh, the, the video game industry um, is projected to be a 90 billion kind of thing in 2020 um, versus uh, 100 million worldwide in 2017. So the, the world has shifted the amount of uh, video game exposure. Um, and to give you an idea uh, what research is going on in the video game industry, the identifiable trackable information that kids are at play and what they do is they, they generate um, so much um, identifiable trackable behavior to kind of keep kids in a game loop. So kids are just like uh, test, testes for these games have no idea uh, that all their behavior on these video games are just categorized and, and historyed out. So they're able to kind of show and get better and better and better. So uh, Call of Duty is the best example. There's, there's 10 or 12 versions of them. Each one gets better and better and better. So many kids get kind of sucked in easily, even more. There's like 12 now. But everybody remembers a couple of years ago, Fortnite, the free game called Fortnite, you know, people spend up to $1.8 billion on this free game because it, it hooks you in to play for free. But then the next thing you know, to get to the next level, to get to this next thing, you need to buy the next skin. And, and, and the same neurologic thing that happens when you're playing a video game is the same setup when you're, when you're uh, uh, gambling addiction. So the same neurologic kind of setup for video game addiction is the same setup for gambling addiction. And that's what I'm really worried about in this next generation, the amount of exposure uh, that they've had to video game industry and what they're up against and the compulsion loops uh, that they've been significantly up against. So uh, for those people who don't know, a uh, favorite statistic that I always bring up in a lot of my talks is uh, the average age of a gamer is 36 years old. So, so many uh, young kids get exposed to uh, older adults. And again, these are, uh, 36 year olds that are, that's the average age of a kid uh, watching a video game somewhere or playing a video game, I'm sorry, somewhere uh, and, and playing games with kids that are 12, 14, 13. And again, I don't know if I want uh, people exposed to that kind of interplay. And that's, that's work for parents to understand. And again, parents to understand the depth or, or the discrepancy here. Everybody remembers that great 
Pac-Man game in 1982 generated 7 million copies sold total. So again, give you an idea that the context of the billions of dollars today uh, that are involved in this industry um, is, is massively different than it was. And so just to be mindful of that. Um, the mental health piece is tied directly into the substance abuse piece. And, and when it comes to, to the social media and the, the complexity of it, I just want to touch on one thing. Uh, the kids that feel abandoned today that don't have strong relationships that are struggling connecting via social media, that's the kid that I'm really worried about that are still going back. I'm not really up against FOMO today because everybody's kind of supposedly locked in their home. Now kids are trying to play pranks and, and post things on Instagram every day. Uh, but so many kids are not up against what they're usually up against on a Friday night, looking at everybody's Instagram, feeling like they're left out. So we're not up against that component, but we are up against just that disconnect and that and abandonment. So um, with substance abuse, kids are still downloading where to purchase, where to get it, the accessibility, the affordability, YouTube videos of how to, the you know, anonymous blog sites that are still available to them. We're worried about substance abuse and as as folks are not getting usually supply train and liquor stores closing during the COVID-19, but it's just something to be mindful of as well. Uh, kids are also learning about it way more, getting into glorification, live streaming, impact of Snapchat. Uh, so parents can't monitor that, but it's really important for parents to check that out. I'm not gonna have time to get into couples counseling tonight, but I do do couples counseling. And, and uh, Kim, you're aware of the joke that uh, my wife will be presenting one of these series, uh, I think in a couple of weeks, uh, that she busted me that we used to have technology free night on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Uh, we fell into a pattern of not doing it. Last weekend, we did commit uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, uh, and we shut it down because we've been overwhelmed with texts and, and calls with clients and, and families in crisis. And both of us are clinicians and both of us run programs and we both needed time to shut off and shut down uh, because if we don't, we're not gonna, we're gonna miss each other and, and that's the potential danger in any relationship, in any, in any home, it's susceptible. And kids, again, watch what you guys do. Um, so here are some signs to look out for. Um, and, and again, these are the context of the past, but they're also context of today in the COVID-19 days that, again, if they're staying up all night and if they're, they're not hanging with their friends during the day or not hanging with the family that they can during the day, I was just working with a young man that's staying up all night and he's sleeping all day, and so he's not seeing his family, even like the three people that he can see in his own home. And that's a critical concern for me. Um, he did seem anxious over the call today. He did seem also depressed, and I really confronted him to kind of give him uh, a challenge to, to not play video games. He, he locked in, and he was able to pull up, uh, which you can pull up either on your iPhone or you can pull up on certain video games. He was able to live, uh, I was on a Zoom call with him, so he shared a screen with me and he showed me how many hours he's been playing the game. And I think it was 22 from Saturday to now. And I said, well, how many hours did you put into schoolwork? And he said, nothing, you know? And so again, like, and how many times did he hang out with his family or how many times day he's got two brothers in the house and he didn't spend any time and he's feeling depressed. And I'm like, and I know you like the impact of the game and that, that impulsivity of the game kind of gives you that loop of that feel good or that winning uh, an event, but, but sitting with somebody and, and having a conversation and, and looking at somebody's eyes and being able to connect uh, with oxytocin is, is such a vital thing. So his homework assignment was to walk his dog. Uh, and so that's a vital thing if, if you have uh, something going on. So that's really important. So, uh, but things to look out for, like physical changes, uh, weight loss, um, back aches. It's funny, like I'm actually, I was just telling Kim, like I have to watch my posture and how I'm standing because I'm at a standing desk and I sit half the day because it's really important to watch your posture uh, when, you're, when you're looking at things. Um, there's a quiz on, on if you think you have a problem uh, with um, the internet or with technology. Uh, and these, again, are in context of today as well. They're not just in the past. Uh, that are really important to know. So how can families help? What can families do? Uh, I think that's why a lot of you guys are on this call. So there's a lot of things you can do. And the first simple thing is, is talking with your kids about it, not at your kids and not lecturing your kids, but talking with them about it. Um, and so it's really uh, important to, to look at um, um, how to create a family culture around screen time, how to how to create a time, a family time and a home time that you, you have technology free zone, technology free time. Uh, and, and you got to interrupt the day 
parts of the day without having technology, even in this time, it's vital to kind of make sure you're, you're not staring at screens all day long. I have homework assignments every day where I'm telling clients to read a book, to write in a journal, to old school write in pen and paper, as opposed to staring at a screen to use notes. Uh, so I'm really uh, kind of challenging folks to get away from screen times whenever they can, wherever they can. Um, and again, even in COVID-19, I'm working with a family that set up a contract for their, their child around video games. Because uh, at this time, it's such a vital time. The kid feels like he doesn't have school. He doesn't have anything going on. And I'm like, but this is the time the kid also needs boundaries. And, and it's so important to have a contract that you can renegotiate, that, that you can open up a little bit and have different time frames this time. But this is, this is the important time to make sure you can do that. Uh, it's so good to talk about um, what it's like from digital di uh, dignity uh, to digital footprint. You know, in our world, people look at our histories of how we interact and how we present ourselves. So it's really vital to look at your digital footprint as well. I'm sure I'll look back on this video and say that my, my screen wasn't that great or the lighting wasn't great or something like that. I did have, but I gotta be easy on myself. We can, we just wanted to put this out there tonight and make sure that uh, it, it's really important. So I apologize, I, I lost it there. I'm trying to go back to the screen sharing moment. Um, and I just wanna fly through a couple notes. This is something to look out for for yourselves, for your kids. Watch out for headaches, as I said. Watch out for dehydrated eyes, back pain, energy levels, sleep patterns. No joke, the first week I started seeing spots at night when I walked outside. I walked my dog at the end of the day some nights, and I just walked, and, and I was literally seeing spots from staring at a screen too long. And then I started to make breaks through my day, and I'm now taking way more breaks away from screen, and I'm feeling a lot better. And it's so important to look out for. Uh, for families that have kids, uh, for adolescents and ch children, uh, it's really important for 18 months and younger to have no screen time or limit. It's only live video for family or friends during this time. And, and that was, by the way, this was put out by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, and, and it's a, there's a direct link on this. Um, and this was put out months before the COVID-19. This was actually fall this year, uh, fall 2019. Uh, but that, that still stands. It, but like if, you, if your screen time is you're seeing family and, and the kids are able to see family, that's one thing. But we really want kids under the age of 18 months to not have really any screen time at all. There's so much developmental brain matter that occurs. We're worried about what's called gray matter happening in the developmental brain. So 18 months to two years, we want to limit our screen time and avoid solo use as much as possible, two to five. And so if you guys have ladies and grandkids, watch out from the two to five year old hours, about an hour a day is okay, but to watch that if parents involved or parents are looking over the shoulder, six or older, place consistent limits, consistent times, and don't let screen time affect sleep, exercise, or other behaviors. And so many families are, are asking me every day this week, oh Mike, we're in this situation, we're in COVID-19, we're all in the house. But yeah, but you have to have downtime, you have to have play time, you have to have other activities to make sure that they're, they're not just stuck there uh, is really important. A couple last other notes to think about during this time is specifically check your ergonomics, your workstation, uh, how far away you are from, from staring at a screen is really important. Same thing with kids um, and how um, restrict entertainment to related screen time to two to three hours a day, less a day and again, um, uh, take 20, 20 rule uh, every 20 minutes you're on a screen time, take 20 second break and looking 20 feet away literally just kind of helps the eyes adjust. And that's another thing. So I'll take a screenshot and I'll send you a picture of the way that I have things set up. I have a lot of pictures above uh, my screen. So I'm able to like look at pictures and remind myself of my family, but it helps again, adjust my eyes. It's a simple trick. That's really important. And, and re remind kids, I, I know it sounds strange uh, to blink because literally when they're watching the screen time so much, they forget they're stuck on the screen and they're looking at things. Uh, it's so funny uh, that they, they for literally forget. Uh, and so, and then the last couple uh, slides are more about uh, screen time ideas, um, screen, uh, screen time contracts. I apologize, I'm trying to shove in a lot of information. Um, so I'll just walk through this as opposed to run through this. Uh, screen time contract ideas, even at COVID-19 when you're doing homeschooling. And, I, and again, I, I, I commend all the homeschool parents uh, that are doing this. 
Uh, I respect you guys a ton. Uh, my kid is, as you guys know, is 11 month old, so I'm I'm not doing that much teaching on the home front. Uh, but having a, having a relationship with technology Monday through Friday, and then having a weekend relationship or having weekend or holiday or travel time, but having real time that it's blackout time. And, and a lot of times it gets down to the, to the device storage time and when when things are a good time to shut off is like when you need to charge charge the screen time. And it is it's still a privilege. It's not just an explanation even during COVID-19. There is a piece around safety and security uh, and again, a big thing during this time is passwords to make sure kids can feel free to make sure the parents have passwords to their kids' technology at any time, uh, even through high school. And I would even suggest through college just as a backup, just in case anything happens during this time. And again, parents, families, you want to watch your digital modeling behavior, kids watch what you do, even on social media, how many parents are posting about, you know, there's uh, something about wine in, in this COVID-19 and, and, and it's just... You know, kids watch what the families are posting even in a digital way. So look at how you are. Um, so uh, the last couple of slides are, are those basic kind of components for interventions for families, of uh, real importance around communication. And again, how you talk to kids and inviting kind of dialogue as opposed to talking at a kid. Uh, one of my favorite interventions for families that could remember that show, um, Columbo. Columbo was this old detective show where he would have like a, Peter Colombo would have a, a question at the end of the, the episode and the wrap up of the episode, he would kind of have it all figured out, but he would ask questions of the, the people involved. And in that moment, you know, he kind of knew that he knew, but it was better coming from the people that were involved. So asking questions and getting a kid to own or a young adult own their relationship with technology is such a vital thing. So actually talking with a kid and asking questions, inviting questions, and open-ended questions is more important than trying to tell a kid how to have the relationship. Uh, when I'm in an audience sometimes and I see people's faces, I ask people how many people here like being told what to do. Uh, not Usually not many hands go up. Uh, so that's the same principle when it comes to technology and kids. Kids don't like being told how they can have a relationship with technology, but can you ask them how do you feel about being on your technology all night long? How do you feel when you can't sleep or how do you feel if your body aches from it? And again, a lot of my clients, adolescent and adult, are complaining about how they feel about staring at their screen time too much. So they need this time to really vitally kind of take breaks, take breathers, take perspective, and so not to like lag on to just lock it on to staring at from one screen to the next screen to the next screen. I'm saying take a real clean, free time from technology for a period of time. I apologize. I know I've been speaking very quickly. I'm trying to shove in. I I told Kim I would try to get this all in in about an hour so I can open up to questions. And, I, and again, I, I hope to mention that anytime you can chat the questions in uh, or raise your hand, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Again, I hope to, if you guys have any questions around how to be helpful. Um, but the last couple pieces uh, when talking with kids is asking, asking them about their online activity, asking them about their social media, uh, getting them to share images with you, getting them to share what they're viewing, uh, open up and see, like literally uh, hold their device and get them to share and show you what, what they're looking at either uh, with Instagram friends or Facebook friends and what they're following because these are influencers. These are true influencers. So we want to get the avenue of influence and understanding of what the kids are kind of getting exposed to and, and a reality check. So if they're they're thinking like the Kardashians are, are a real kind of lifestyle, uh, then you want to have a dialogue with them. Is Kim Kardashian somebody that you think that you'll be in the next couple of years? That's a conversation I literally had last week with a 14 year old that was thinking that was going to be their lifestyle. And again, because they follow the Kardashians on Instagram, God love the, the Kardashians, that's great. But again, that's how saturated they are in that world. And they think that's the reality. And so that's where I had to have a reality check with them. And again, I was thinking, so do you think you're able to live that lifestyle? And do you think you're able to kind of get there? And, and that was a really interesting conversation. I wish I could share more with you, but that's the short version. So asking them like who they're listening to, what they're watching, how they're involved, and, and getting, getting them to talk about it is so important. Um, and so lastly, a couple uh, notes around, um, uh, again, parents, you're a thousand school teachers, uh, you as parents are modeling behavior. So a lot of times 
you have to know like kids are going to watch what you do. So if you want to have technology free night, you need to put it down yourself. If you want to have a better relationship with technology for your kids and your family, you want to have it better for yourself as well. So, so being that example at first might be the first step and, and, and really having a better relationship with that, I think be really important uh, because you, you got to live by example and show kids what kind of things you want to have, what kind of behaviors you want to have about putting it down and, and letting kids uh, have their own relationship. Uh, so usually I end um, on how great technology is and, and how, uh, again, in our community in, in mental health and substance abuse counseling, it was a hard pivot about a month ago and we've moved into telehealth very quickly. All of the therapists at Ethos and Therapeutic Alliance have all taken a hard pivot and all providing outpatient and intensive outpatient services. All insurance companies are recognizing, all state licensures are following up with us. And so we're providing good help and, and residential programs are still existing and doing a great job. Uh, but from an outpatient perspective, therapy can still exist in this platform and is a viable way to kind of get kids help and continue to get help. So know that resources, resources, resources are available. Um, one of the things with COVID-19 that they did in China is they actually um, tracked people via their cell phones to track uh, where it was heading and what was happening. I don't know if we'll do that in the U.S., but again, there's, there's discussion around being able to track certain things a little bit more live time action. And, and my hope is that we'll be able to utilize this in our communication. Like clearly we were able to get a, a better handle on communication with technology and with live communication and up-to-date information. And again, that helps resources and, and, and get resources to where they're needed clearly in New York this week. And my heart goes out to families. If, if anybody's got any families up in New York, um, but it's one of these things where we're going to know where the next New York's going to hit because of this technology, because we're, we're actively talking about it. So again, it is really important to be aware of uh, how accessible technology has been to us. And again, it's not the enemy. It's how we're utilizing it, how we're adjusting with it, and how we're allowing it to be a part of, being a part of our, our dynamic today. Um, so I know uh, I didn't cover every corner of this thing called technology. And again, um, if you're worried about it uh, as a family and as an individual, um, please uh, take breaks is the biggest, biggest message around. Try to try to watch how much you're involved in technology. Look at uh, the mindless scrolling. That's the, the first, the, the, the first couple slides I had up. Be real mindful of like, you know, not thinking about what you're digesting, what you're kind of taking in because all of a sudden you could be just kind of watching some crap and not really be paying attention. Uh, challenge uh, what your news agencies are giving you or challenge yourself around uh, how much news you're taking in or when you want to take the news in. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, when I work with individuals, um, I tell people you want to open up documents and you want to read documents when you're ready to read documents. Uh, you want to read news when you're ready to read news. And sometimes uh, during my day, uh, when I'm sitting here and I'm really needing to be here for clients, I kind of tune out the news and I, and I take a break and only watch it at the end of the day. So I'm able to like really be present because uh, I found myself uh, one day, a couple weeks back, really upset, jumping right into a session where that was in the back of my mind. So I, I again, I'm fine tuning this relationship with technology in this time. So know that when I was preparing to give this talk tonight, this is kind of like Mike Blanche, you know, uh, trying to fix a plane while this plane is in flight. You know, we are all adjusting to this life of COVID-19, we're all trying to pivot and move in this direction of trying to have a healthier relationship with technology to make it be more connected and more strategic and more available as opposed to not thinking about it, mindless scrolling, mindlessly kind of taking in whatever kind of dumps in us. Uh, and, I, and again, I challenge everybody on the call to be more thoughtful and mindful of their relationship with technology. So um, that's about it. I'm, I'm about to wrap up in about 30 seconds. I promised Kim I'd end around eight o'clock. I'm, 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 I'm almost online. Um, this link, um, as well as many, many other links, um, is on Kim's website. Uh, that'll be a part of the conversation, the conversation zone that she showed you. That's why I stopped her and had her kind of pull it up again, just for you guys and ladies to see. It's a fantastic website with a lot of great resources. Um, and, and again, uh, this, this presentation will be up as well as my PowerPoint will be up. Uh, and I'll just scroll through at the end, the last couple um, PowerPoints, just for you guys to see um, other aspects of other things that are going on, um, access to 
And again, I talked about earlier about how many resourcing, uh, recovery resourcing things are available for families and friends. Uh, more resources and GPS sustains and monitoring trends, and global awareness, uh, and then helpful links um, and different kind of live kind of up-to-date information that you can click on and link to. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll send that. So um, I want to thank Kim again and thank Tessa again for uh, her, her help out tonight. So again, do you guys have any questions or Kim, do you have any questions or is that okay? Or is that what you hope to get That's out of awesome. That All right, great. Good. Um, we, we don't have any Good. questions yet, but I'm, so I want to really encourage people to um, kind of share their thoughts. And one thing I would love to know is um, if there are any suggestions that people might have that they're employing, you know, I can tell you just one, just to kind of kick that off, um, you know, using technology doesn't have to mean looking at a screen. Podcasts are so amazing, you know, and, yeah. and I often, you know, I don't have kids in the house. I don't have people running around that I can actually have conversation with. So sometimes I like a little company. So I put yeah. on a podcast when I'm doing some other thing, you know, a chore or whatever. You could be like knitting or gardening or whatever. Um, but just to have a podcast on and listen to it. And of course, most of the ones that I'm listening to now are about COVID-19. My God, there's such a huge archive of pro of um, topics that you yep. can listen to StoryCorps and hear about something completely yep. unrelated. And it could be a time even to bring the family together and have almost like going way back to the old, sure. you know, radio, <laughs> like yeah, 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 to yeah. the radio. Sure, and, sure, sure. Um, you know, just I really, that way. no, I really recommend uh, Dax Shepard as a as a comedian and he's a he's an actor and he does this thing called Armchair Experts where he interviews comedians and he interviews other actors and actors he's sober and he always gets people that are sober and they the recover community to talk about their relationship status and everything else so again the lighter stuff too to listen in the background is really helpful so not just the heavy stuff again that's that's a that's a good point to think about so yeah definitely right so yeah uh, what um somebody said great job thanks rick i appreciate it and again like when it comes to other things beyond just podcasts, because I agree, like it doesn't have to be just screen time. There's other things that you can utilize to kind of keep notes. Uh, I have reminders set everywhere uh, so that I can always kind of keep myself uh, on target and staying on top of things. So I utilize kind of uh, reminders uh, either on my phone uh, to, to send me. So that's another great one as well. So, okay. Mike, are you able to see these questions or would you like yes. us to come off to you? No, no, no. So I can, I can start reading off. Is there any downside to online AA, Alan, Alan, parents, support group meetings? Have you seen anything mentioned? Uh, thanks, Bill, for showing up tonight. Uh, is there any downside to online meetings? Um, the one downside I would mention for, for ladies and gentlemen in recovery, I always miss the 2020 club, the, the five or 10 minutes before a meeting, the five or 10 minutes after a meeting where people are able to interchange. And, and that's something I always worry because that gets lost a little bit in, in the classic kind of 12-step nonverbal. hey how you doing let me bounce and say hi to that person real quick so that does happen a little bit um, but i was on a meeting um online meeting it was very formal very very thoughtful there was 100 people on narvith midday a couple weeks ago and people were, were very kind of uh, procedural about putting up their hands and so it, it ran really well so all the feedback i've gotten about online zoom meetings in, in aa have been great. They're all moved to password protected. So to make sure no one's bombing the meeting. So that's been really thoughtful as well. And the same thing goes for Al-Anon and the parent support groups as well. Kim, do you want to mention the parent support groups, like what your experience has been from the online experience there? Yeah, I'd be happy to. It's been so far, we've only had, uh, is it two or three now? I think two programs so far um, and it three, me, I don't know, whatever. It's been great. It's been really good because I think that some people are finding their way to us who um, you know, we actually have some parents that don't like to drive at night, you know, and so that's actually one way that they can yes. come, come to see us. Um, but also we've had people that don't normally engage that share a little bit more openly. It just maybe is less intimidating, perhaps. So that's a big plus, I think. Um, and it's just kind of a nice way too for people to just listen in um, almost like a live um, you know, being in an open meeting, but not sharing that that can be beneficial to some people. It's less maybe intimidating, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, and I've recommended clients that struggle and go into their first meeting that they can log on, they can listen, they don't have to share their, their screen, they, don't, they can make their name anonymous, and you can just kind of sit in and, and see what it's like. So it's a great introduction for folks that are struggling with that connection. 
Um, the next question down, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. My five-year-old gets 30 minutes of kid learning and 30 minutes of fun choices of, of her own time or 30 minutes of TV time. Is, is TV considered screen time? Uh, so uh, it's a great question. Um, one of the things when it comes to kids uh, and one of the research shows is the smaller screen is where we worry about with kids. So literally sometimes like the big flat screen TVs, literally it's like the eye development piece as well. So that's for uh, babies and adolescents up to three to five years old. So I uh, kind of am on the fence about, you know, considering TV time, it is a screen, it is technology, uh, but it is a little bit different uh, than, than this. Uh, so I tell people a lot of times people are watching a big screen together as a family. So there's a lot of nonverbal things. They're talking about what they're seeing on the big screen. So does that make sense, Kim? Do you want to comment to that at all? Or does that answer your question? Does the, the lady want to comment any more or does that help? I'm going to go with, that's good. Okay. Um, any, the next question I'm going to ask, uh, if the person can re-ask the question a little bit, appreciate the resources and any access to PP or BB, BPOC um, are all beneficial and needed. What is PP or BPOC? So, so thank you for that question. Yes. <laughs> BPOC is be a part of the conversation. Oh, okay, and good. parent partnership is PP. So um, yes, you can visit our website, which is conversation.zone. Anytime, there's lots of resources on there. And parent partnership is, is basically be a, is just conversation.zone slash parent partnership. So um, that is the meeting that normally is held Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at three different locations. But during this time, we're, we've kind of consolidated them. There's actually a new meeting on Tuesday nights happening right now. And also our Wednesday night, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, and I'm happy to share that as well with all of you and the follow-up email that you'll get. Tessa, maybe you'll remind me to do that. Um, to share the link to parent partnership meetings that are taking place online every Wednesday night at seven. So thanks Great. for asking that question. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> I just, uh, there's so many acronyms I can remember. And I, can't I know. Remember them, so I that's know. great. So it's good. Uh, so Adam Lush, thank you from uh, Adam's from Karen Foundation and a uh, great program. Amazing. Uh, thank you uh, for your comments uh, about uh, And then um, what are your thoughts on non-digital forms of entertainment? I found recently reading a hard copy book was more relaxing than usual. Some other thoughts are board games, puzzles, absolutely. Artistic activities, painting, except uh, that's amazing. Yeah, if you can get into painting and, and uh, any, anything, uh, crafting and anything, and uh, I'm finding uh, interested in taking your uh, psychological impact on these types of activities versus digital time. And again, Adam, great point. This idea is that like any kind of like needlepoint, anything to get creative and, and uh, paint or resource or uh, it's such a great thing to kind of have some other, and I can't find a cooler word for hobby. And if you ever find a cooler word than hobby, please let me know. But basically like having outlets uh, that are like this are amazing. So reading a hard copy book, uh, drawing, uh, doodling, anything with the hands and the eyes, not looking at a screen is a fantastic way. Uh, uh, learning a guitar. I have a client that's learning the piano at home. There, and there's great resources on YouTube of how to learn the piano and that kind of stuff. So, so thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and then Kim, this is, can you talk about the new experience of having mom dad kids online through the day? Your school is going to have multitask. Oh, okay. Oh, so um, I apologize. I'm reading the question, trying to answer the question. So let me ask the question first and I'll read the question out loud. Um, can you talk about the new experience of having mom, dad, and kids um, all at home, all online through uh, throughout the day, uh, dealing with school, dealing with work, having multitasking going on, multiple screens, uh, and trying to do two things at once? Uh, because yeah, a lot of families, and I appreciate that, Pam. Um, so Pam Roberts, nice to see you, thank you for that. Um, when it comes to multiple parents um, that are having their kids at home with multiple kids and, and they're doing schooling and uh, they're also trying to work from home, it is, I, I give you guys a lot of credits. So the idea is to really try, if you can, with your employer to set up a schedule that you can, and I was working with a client that schedules out certain things and, and his wife does a certain time frame, and then they switch off and on 
Um, uh, one of our, our friends, our colleagues, um, Patrick and Stephanie are, are a great couple. Uh, Patrick is working full days on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and his wife is working Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, and so the one is staying home with the kids and the other, kid, the other parent's staying home with the kids. So again, it's like learning how to, to, to kind of uh, drink water through a fire hose these days or learning how to kind of balance multiple plates with the job expectation is really vital. But I think communicating and really scheduling and then being flexible with the schedule is the best answer. So mapping it out as best you can, but being easy on yourself and knowing uh, when you got to get school. And some schools are doing better a job at it than others. Some schools are really been thoughtful about their presentations and some schools are very, very well equipped. And, and what I'm finding is other schools are just sending kind of mail in stuff to kind of keep busy work for kids. And it really, it really depends on the school district. So uh, it's really about communication on the home phone. I'm sorry, I didn't have like a salient punch answer for that, uh, but I hope that helps. Um, does anyone else want to make a comment about that or share about that or as a parent? Um, I feel like I got an easy one of, of an 11 month old, as I said, but I know <laughs> there's a lot of kids and a lot of parents out there that are trying to manage more than that. So, so yeah. Is so there any other thing? No other questions right now, I don't think, but feel free, guys, if you still want to chime in with any questions, just a reminder, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen if you have anything else you'd like to ask about or comment or share some thoughts. But one thing that occurred to, uh, to me is a really good friend of mine and her husband um, made the really unfortunate decision to switch with um, cable providers about a week ago. So they went from either Comcast or Verizon or Verizon to Comcast, one or the other, and something went awry and they were actually without Wi-Fi for almost a week. Oh. So you can't go to Starbucks right now. No. So, you know, I think that, that what a lot of us are trying to find these silver linings during this pandemic as, wow, well, we now have this opportunity to take, to really be grateful for things that we normally took for granted. Absolutely. And I think that's what happens when we, and, and like last week, Tesla lost power for a while. So, you know, we have some storms coming up later this week. Yep. What happens yep. then, you know? So, yep. so maybe we can think about, you know, that that's kind of a double challenge if that should happen to somebody that, True. so th again, thinking about being creative, losing the technology for a while, um, but there are absolutely those possibilities out there that um, we don't have, we can't run to hook into somebody else's Wi-Fi right now. So um, I don't know how on earth they, they cause they work, and the, you know, so anyway, it's just an interesting, yeah. interesting situation no but one of the things you brought up there kim is this idea that like looking out for the little things and again i'm grateful that it's happening right now i know this is a horrible there's no perfect time for this but right. i'm literally seeing green grass come up i'm seeing flowers bloom i'm literally seeing and i'm looking for those little things uh and, and being able to capture those moments and look out for those little things in life and again it's really this whole pandemic has slowed us down to really t kind of take pause and self-reflection time. And my last message again is to, to not look further and deeper into technology. I think the technology is doing its job, but it's up to us to look within and to look within our families and look within our world, even, even if our neighborhoods are just going for a walk, uh, to look in the eyes of a neighbor passing by six feet, 10 feet away, uh, to look in their eyes and say hello. Uh, last weekend I went for a walk uh, a socially appropriate, physically distant walk and uh, was able to see some people and, and, and make eye contact. And I said hello to more people in one day in person than I have in a long time and it felt great. So don't forget about the subtlety of, of holding the door for somebody, of being able to make eye contact with somebody and, and say hello and good morning because it really feels a lot different today when we see people live action. So uh, if there's no other questions, uh, better words for hobby. Thanks. Uh, leisure <laughs> activity, uh, a vocation, and uh, pastime. So thank you, Adam. I appreciate that. That was a great. That was a great answer. So I appreciate that. Hidden talent. Hidden talent. Yes. How about that? Hidden that's talent. Right. Yes. Your your <laughs> hidden talent. Right. Exactly. So that's good. All right. So on that note, Kim, thank you again. I'll, I'll pause and say if you guys have any questions, I'll have this PowerPoint sent over to you so that I can be a part of that as well. Great, great. Just great. another thank you. So, Mike, thank you so much. That was beautiful. I really appreciate Thanks. it. I know it's been a long day. Um, sure. can't, can't thank you enough. Thank you to all the participants who are online with us. Um, again, hope to, that you'll join us again. We have lots more great topics coming up next week. Pam and Bill are going to be with us, hopefully, and or at least one of them. Love to have the dream team back together. 
Um, but we'll be talking more about parenting and the challenge of setting boundaries at this time, you know, with our kids who might have some of these struggles. So uh, more on that to come. Thank you all again. Be safe and have a great night. Thanks.